everybody. Uh, we are going to continue our conversation about gradient descent here. Uh, we introduced the topic with 1D examples and I think some basic calculus um, common sense that helps us to figure out which direction we can, can move in to find uh, a local minimum or a local maximum point if we wanted to adjust our uh, technique a little bit. Um, but this isn't typically what gradient descent is used for. Gradient descent is usually used for very tough problems and ones that involve more dimensions. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to set the stage for right here. We're going to uh, introduce some notation and a new operation for some of you, although some of you will already have this as uh, a bit of a review. Uh, and then we're going to use uh, it to put together a scheme that is going to seem a little bit ugly, but should make sense in that if you understand what we just did in the previous lecture, then this one should make sense as well. It's just gonna seem a lot uglier and that's really what it comes down to. So why don't we jump into it? <clears throat> we are talking about gradient descent, which is usually used for higher dimensional problems and finding extreme points in that case can be very, very challenging. Um, the process from the first example that we talked about, I introduced that for a reason. I introduced it because I think it's easy to see how it works, right? If we if if the function's moving downward, okay, we need to move forward to get closer to the minimum point. If it's moving upward, it's moving away from the minimum point, so we have to step backward. Makes a lot of sense. Um, we have to take some care when moving to multiple dimensions, though. So in our in our um, first example, uh, to figure out which point we proceed to test next, we could advance in only two possible directions, and those were left or right. Okay with two variables. So we're just talking about two here, our objective functions become surfaces. So if we have a function of say both X and Y, then for every X and Y there is one Z, you get this three dimensional function of some sort. And uh, I just want to, to kind of point out, right? You might have an initial estimate that puts you, oh, right about, oh, that's a terrible color. Cause it kind of blends in right away. What if I do bright red right here? If I have this point that's right here at say two, two, it looks like, whoops, two, two, I can evaluate that point in the function. Which direction do I step in next? Well, it's not a matter of left and right anymore, is it? There are a lot of ways that I can uh, step in, in terms of X and Y, and that's what the biggest challenge is. Which way do we know is the correct way? How do we see which way is going up versus going down or, or whatever else that's tough? Our goal is still the same, right? We want to figure out what um, uh, what variables, what the x and y values are at which the function uh, attains an extreme point. Uh, in that last example, that picture, a minimum point. Suppose we have an initial guess for this, x, y equals p0, q0. So when determining where to, where to test next, the difference between this and our 1D example is that there are not just two directions to move. And hey, there aren't even four. It's not like a left, right, up, or down. I could move in any spectrum of directions in between the two, right? Or in between, right? There's an infinite number of possible directions that we can step to. Um, but there is a tool in advanced calculus that can be really, really helpful to um, point us in exactly the right direction and that is the gradient. So we're gonna introduce that right now. Again, some of you are already gonna know what this is, but that's okay. Don't be afraid, okay? I know that it's it's new calculus, it might seem really tough and so on, but it's really not bad. The gradient is a vector, okay? It's a vector of partial derivatives of f that basically tell us the slope in many different directions, all right? Because here's, die f1 or die f by die x1 die f die x2 all the way through to die f die xn if the function f is a function of n variables and i'm assuming that all of these derivatives ex exist in the ways that we need them to and so on <clears throat> so that's that doesn't have to be a discussion point for this when evaluated at a particular point so suppose i take this gradient and i evaluate at a particular point we obtain a couple of possibilities we either obtain a non-zero vector that points in the direction of steepest ascent, okay? That is, 
if I take this vector valued quantity by taking all of these partial derivatives and I'm interested in what this quantity is at a particular point, I can plug in that point and the vector I get is going to point in the direction where the slope is steepest. And that could be all sorts of different directions, right? But it'll give me one, uh, one direction where if I were to walk in that direction, I'd have the tough, toughest time going up that hill. Okay. Or we could get the zero vector. And in that case, we are at a horizontal tangent. And that might correspond to an extreme point in the same way that a zero derivative might correspond to a, uh, a max or a min in a 1D function. So I, I just want to do like a little cute example down here because I don't have one planned otherwise. But let's just suppose that our f of x and y to a two variable function here was x squared plus y cubed. Okay. Um, you could plot this using uh, mathematical software and so on. But um, the point here is to just calculate the gradient and show you kind of what this means. If I were to take the gradient um, of f, I'm going to get a vector of partial derivatives, and it's going to be the, the partial derivative of this function with respect to x. That's just 2x. And then the partial derivative of this function with respect to y, and that's 3y squared. And if I, so I don't have any idea what this function this function looks like, so I just made it up off the top of my head, right? It looks like, you know, maybe it, with y it increases like a cubic, and with x, so as y gets very large, positive, it grows really big. As y gets really big, negative, you're going to be subtracting off something very, very big, so it's going to fall off somehow. But in the x, it behaves like kind of like a parabola, right? As x increases negatively or positively, the surface is going to increase either way. Um... The gradient, this vector of partial derivatives, is given by 2x and 3y squared. Um, if we to, were to evaluate this, if we evaluate this at x, at, let's say xy equals, um, yeah, let's say what, we need a p and a q value. Like, what are the values that we need? Let's just do uh, 1, 1. If we're interested in what this what this function is doing at the point one one, we get the following. We're gonna get the gradient of f at the point one one, and that's going to give us two three, and this tells us this tells us that okay. Whatever this crazy surface looks like, think of it like a ski hill, okay? If you're standing on the side of a ski hill, if you turn in one direction, you're going to be looking down. If you're going to turn the other direction, you might be looking up. And all the directions in between, well, you know, you're somewhere between maybe the steepest and the least steepest, right? There might even be one direction that you turn in where you're mostly just walking horizontally around the side of the hill, kind of like a, a, um, a line on a, a topography chart, right? A topographic map. Um, what this vector is, what this 2, 3 is, is it's telling you the direction you need to face and walk in in order to have the toughest time going up that hill, the steepest ascent, the steepest slope, okay? So the direction of the steepest slope the direction of the steepest slope is the direction two, three, and exclamation marks because we're excited about it, okay? Um, note that it doesn't tell us how big that slope is, okay? But there are ways to calculate that as well. But for this technique, kind of like how in the 1D example, we were only really concerned about is the slope negative or is the slope positive? Um, here, it'll be kind of the same sort of thing, right? We're just going to want to measure of which direction to go um, in order to get to our next value, that sort of thing. So I just wanted to do that as a basic example so that you could see for yourself um, how this is going to work. So we're about to use this in a formula, and I need us to understand that formula. So here's how it's going to go. And I want to tap into our knowledge that we gained from the last lecture um, that we did, lecture uh, 29, where we did the, the basic uh, 1D scheme for this, because we're going to be doing the same thing 
except um, using this new sort of terminology and this bigger framework, but the, the spirit is exactly the same. So here's how it works. Start with a guess. We're gonna call it P0. Okay, it's it in Rn, that just means it's an n-dimensional vector because we need n different components, whatever that is. Okay, we are going to want to evaluate the gradient of F at that point. And our new test point, right? We're gonna, we wanna step in that direction to a new point to test. And well, if we're doing gradient descent, we're looking for a minimum point. So we want a minimum. Uh, let's think about that for a second. If I take a step forward and I want to go in a particular direction, um, uh, essentially what's, what's happening here is that I'm taking the previous estimate that I have this H is how big of a step that we're taking. And this here, uh, so uh, let's say old point, let's let's actually write this out, old point, the H is the size of our step. And I want to look at this quantity right here. This here is a gradient of our, our F at the uh, evaluated at the point that we're at, but we're dividing by something. I want you to take a look at what that something is. What this something is, is the magnitude of that quantity. And that ratio of the gradient over its own magnitude ensures that what we have is scaled so that it's a unit vector. So that um, supposing those quantities uh, given by the gradient aren't so, are, are, are really, really large for whatever reason, in the case that, you know, things are steep right now, that my next step forward doesn't bring me like, that, that it's an appropriately small step forward, essentially. So what this is, this is scaled so that um, it is a unit vector, right? So the bottom is just the magnitude of that vector. When you divide by the magnitude, you get a unit vector. Um, the, other the other thing that I want you to take note of is the fact that I have a minus sign right here. And the minus sign is because we want descent and not ascent. Okay, so that minus sign, that minus sign is there exactly because, okay, if um, our gradient is pointing in the direction of steepest ascent, then the negative of that will point directly backwards, which will be this, the direction of steepest descent. And that's what we're trying to do. If this is a scheme for a minimization problem, right? Suppose we wish to minimize a, a, a multivariable function is how we started this whole thing. I need a minus sign there. Of course, if you're trying to maximize, you're going to flip that around and make that a plus sign to make sure that you're going in the direction of steepest ascent. Of course, again, scaled using that unit vector um, to make sure that you're not taking too big of a step forward. So it's tough. But all of the different pieces I think should make sense. Right? Like it's all defined according to the math in the last page and then justified a little bit by our 1D example from that last from that last uh, lecture. So understand that really well. And then spiritually, all that's happening here is the same thing but in three dimensions. I have a point. I'm going to take a step in the right direction, which is the direction of steepest descent with that minus sign. And um, it's going to be governed by um, the step size of h. Um, so that's that's it. Uh, and as I said, that division by the magnitude of the gradient is important so that we have to obtain a unit vector. Okay, what you want to do? We don't even know that this is going to be our our next our next estimate. We have to evaluate it because just like before, we might take too big of a step forward and get to a point which was higher. And we wouldn't want to include that, right? We would want to step to some place that's closer to that minimum. So we have to evaluate the new test point. If f at this test point is less than f at where we were, then the test point must be closer to a minimum than our old point was. It becomes our next estimate. Okay. If it is not less, then we we know that we went into the right direction because of the calculus behind things. So we have to have overstepped our minimum point. In other words, our h was too large. And so what you want to do 
is define that step size h to be smaller by some factor and try to take another step. Okay, so take a step in half, a, a half, half the size step, and hopefully you don't overstep it. Try again, evaluate that, see how you're doing. Okay, and you can repeat the process again and again and again until the h is small enough, maybe within one one thousandth or one one millionth, if you have it uh, all set up automatically. Um, so that you know that you've got to be no more than that far away from your minimum point. Huh. So that's how it's going to go. But it's really just the same thing. It's just in three dimensions. And uh, we're going to do a, a kind of ugly example. So bear with me on this one. Okay. What's funny is that this is an, a simple example. Because, um, you know, uh, we could use some calculus. You could use some, um, if you took advanced calculus... You could use some simple techniques to figure out exactly what the, the minimum was. But we want to show off that the gradient descent algorithm works. So I want to make sure that, um, you know, if we have the scheme set up as it is, and we have some sort of initial guess that our scheme moves us towards that minimum point. I chose a relatively a somewhat interesting function that has a simple minimum. If we did a complicated function, it would be almost impossible to do this by hand in any sort of reasonable way, which is why I chose this approach. But generally speaking, I would like to use a simple example to kind of foster some trust that this approach works. And then we can take that and maybe program something with it and apply it to whatever kinds of bigger problems that you like. So hopefully, hopefully that makes some sense for you. Um, it's tough, right? It's tough to figure out what things are most effective, but... Let's work with this function. f equals the ln of x squared plus y squared plus 1, which has a minimum at 0, 0. Okay, so we're going to perform at least two iterations of a gradient descent algorithm demonstrating that the scheme moves toward this minimum point. We're using p0 equals 1 and 0 0.5 as an initial guess and an initial step size of h equals 1. Okay. So uh, we're going to include that at the start. Let's get some work done to begin with. I would like to know how big we're talking about. If we start at 1 and 0 0.5, 1 and 0 0.5 is right, oh, 1 and 0, right about here, right? And f of that is going to be some something up there somewhere. So we're far off. We're far off the... Um, uh, uh, the actual minimum point. This is going to be p0 equals uh, 1 and 0 0.5. Funny enough, I've used p0 as a two-dimensional vector here. I think that it originally I defined it as p0 q0, which I'd probably do in code. So it's, I'm being a little bit inconsistent on notation there. But the point is I have an initial guess, and it has to have two components, 1 and 0 0.5 here. So I want to figure out how high the function is there. So let's do that. So first tests, uh, p0, uh, f of, f of 1 and 0 0.5. I'm going to just plug into the function, see how big that is. That's going to be the ln of uh, 1 squared plus 0.5 squared plus 1. And if you work that out, that's ln of 2.25, I get about 0 0.8109. Okay, we're going to keep that in mind because whatever the next guess is, whatever the next point is that I move to, I need to make sure that it's lower than that if I'm looking for a minimum point here. So, um, yeah, what else are we going to need here? We're going to need um, the gradient of our function. So why don't we put that on the right so we have it to refer to. The gradient of f is... Okay, so the notation upside down triangle, F, sometimes you put a little twiddle on top, uh, whatever you like, X, Y equals, and then we have here, I need the X derivative, the Y derivative, and that's going to be 2X, thinking of chain rule, over X squared plus Y squared plus 1, right? I have to take the 1 over the stuff times the derivative of the stuff with respect to X. So that's a 2X. Uh, the second component is going to be 2Y over x squared plus y squared plus 1. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, and that's what we need to refer to uh, in our scheme. So we're going to be using this quantity kind of like how we would um, use the derivative in our 1D uh, example from before. 
So we have this first uh, test uh, f of 1 and 0 0.5. We have this gradient. Let's try to find our next estimate. So um, I don't know whether to kind of squish this up here. I think I might try to because there's a lot of writing to do here. So I apologize in advance. So now we're going to define our P1. Our P1 is going to equal. We're going to take our old point and we're going to walk in the direction of steepest descent, um, an amount that is equal to our step size of one. So this is our H, so this is our H, this is our P0. And we're going to take our gradient, looking at the scheme from the last page, we needed that gradient here. Uh, divided by its own magnitude. So we need to be able to plug, um, uh, we need to be able to plug our x and y equals one and 0 0.5 into that gradient that I wrote up in the top right. So it's gonna be two over, uh, I guess two times one, I'll write it out. And then we have one squared plus 0.5 squared plus one. And then, uh, 2 times 0 0.5 over the same quantity. And I kind of uh, moved in a little bit too close to comfort to the picture of the surface there. Um, also, just so you know, I produced that surface, that picture, using Maple software. So if you're ever interested in learning more, uh, it has some cool functionality there. Uh, I need to divide this by its own magnitude. Okay, so I'm going to actually evaluate this first, just so I don't have to write all of this over again. This here works out to about 0 0.889 and 0 0.444. There's a little bit of round off error that's going to be introduced as we go. And I apologize for that. Try to keep as many decimal places that you'll stay sane on, but I kind of just want to demonstrate the point here. Uh, so we get point. 889 squared plus 0. 0.444 squared and the magnitude of that is going to be the sum of the squares square rooted so that's what that quantity is that we need to do so this i'm just going to remind us where this came from divide by magnitude to get a unit vector okay so you can calculate all of this if you would like and I'll leave that to you. I, all the quantities are split out so you'll see exactly where they come from. Don't forget to subtract it. Don't forget to um, uh, walk from your point as well. You can calculate all of the stuff and then forget to add the one 0 0.5, but that's what we have to do. This leads to P1 equaling, and I got 0 0.1056, 0 0.05331. Okay. We don't know that this is our next point. We have to test this. We have to test it to see if it was, uh, if it produces a smaller value for F than the one that we started with. The first one that we had was 0 0.8109 in height. So this one needs to be less than that. So test this. And if we do, we get the F of 0 0.1056, 0 0.05331 is equal to, plugging into that ln function, it's going to be the ln of 0 0.1056 squared plus 0 0.05331 squared. It's pretty easy to see if you know something about the function. These numbers that you're plugging in are being added to 1, and they're smaller than what we were before. This is going to end up being smaller overall. So this is going to end up being about... 0 0.0139 and this here is smaller than what we had before smaller than our 0 0.8109 so we're going to keep it we're going to keep it so i'm going to put a little check mark there this is going to be our p1 and we are going to say that that's one iteration of the scheme. And I want to just show what happened in terms of that picture there. So um, let's see. If we plug in, if we plug in um, that value, this that uh, for the uh, 
our previous estimate, 1 and 0 0.5. It's going to give us a, a direction of steepest ascent that is this 0 0.889, 0 0.444. And that's going to point in some sort of direction that goes, oh, up this way. So what we're doing by subtracting that off is getting the corresponding, the negative of that vector, which then points inward instead, right? Toward, toward the minimum point. We're scaling it so that we have a predictable amount that, that we're walking forward. And then we're subtracting this from the point we were at and moving in closer. So you see this new estimate that we get to 0 0.1056, 0 0.05331. Now we're down here somewhere. So of course the function's gonna be lower, okay? So hopefully you can see kind of what one step of this process looks like. Now, I asked for two steps. I should have just asked for one. But the thing is, you just repeat this and it's gonna be kind of boring. So if you get it, if you think you get it, um, be careful, but you know, you can stop right now, but please don't. Stay with me. I'm suffering through this, so you can too. P2, maybe I'll leave some of the calculations for you, but P2 is gonna take what we had And it's going to subtract off that h value. And this time we're going to want to, again, calculate um, that gradient. So this is going to be 2 times the first over the sum of the squares. You see how it's really... Like, this is for a super simple example where we could find the minimum by hand if we wanted to. That's why it's hard to come up with examples for this to just do and showcase but I think it is important that we go through it once so that we get it. Um, and then two times 0 0.05331 uh, over this sum of squares. Uh, whoops, 1056. One zero, let's try that again. Matt, 1056 squared plus 0 0.05331 squared plus one. Again, I need the magnitude of this, so I'm just gonna evaluate this because uh, it's just a, num a numerical quantity, right? This here, if you work this out, this is about 0 0.2084, 0 0.1051. I think this is actually due to, to rounding. I think the direction of steep ascent, one is always double the other due to the nature of this function, but we're just going to take it and run with it. It's a little bit beside the point. If we were keeping many de decimals of precision, we would have less and less of this that uh, that comes out. And we divide this by the sum of the squares square rooted of what we just found. So 0 0.2084 squared uh, plus 0 0.1051 squared. Grotesque, right? And you work all of this out after all of that work. And what this end what you end up with here is about uh, minus 0 0.8 ish minus 0.4-ish. I'm gonna put ish and ish. Okay, very close to those. Unfortunately, if you take f of that, if you take f of this, f of minus 0.8 minus 0.4, you actually get a quantity that is larger than the 0.0139 that, uh, that we had, oh shoot, what did I write here, up here? I said F, uh, I said P1 is 0 0.0139. This should be F of, F of P1 is 0 0.0139. I apologize for that. Let's just make that clear. This is F of P1. That's what we were testing here. And then we're gonna keep that, that P1 as this, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to be confusing up there. That's just uh, me losing my head for a second. So yeah, anyway. Um, if you take f of minus 0.8 minus 0.4, we actually get a number that's larger than 0 0.0139. Uh, larger than 0 0.0139. So, don't keep it. We're not going to keep the p2 after all of that all of that work. But think of what just happened. At that point, at that second point that I drew down here close to the origin, this one right here, if we continue to go in the direction of, of steepest descent and walk a whole h equals one forward along that line, what we're doing is 
walking right across the minimum and winding up clear on the other side so that the point that we test is now off in the opposite quadrant and the surface is higher. So the idea is we've gone too far. So let's scale it back. Let's make the h equal to half the size and try again. Okay. So we're going to redefine. So we're going to put an x there. Redefine h to be smaller. And I'm going to put a therefore. If we redefine the h to be smaller, we actually have to do this a few different times to get an f that works. So I'll let this be a for you to try problem because it's really ugly. And you might just say, oh my god, I believe you, Matt. I believe you. Don't make me do this. So if you do h equals 0 0.5, you get p2 equals negative 0.345, negative 0 0.174 right? That's just going back and trying again um, using a different h and putting it right into right into this quantity right there instead of the 1. Uh, so h equals 0 point, uh, 0 0.5 is going to give p2 equals this. And if, if you evaluate that, at, um, if you evaluate f at that point, f of this is still too big. x. h equals 0 0.25. f of, f of, um, sorry, h equals 0 0.5. Two, sorry, 0 0.25. If I put that into that uh, big formula, that's going to give me a p2 that is, uh, and I've worked it out to be minus 0 0.1198 minus 0 0.0604 and if you take f of that it's still too big so all we're doing we're stepping in the same direction same direction same direction but we're still overstepping and getting to a point on the other side that's too big so you keep trying you divide it down h equals 0 0.125 gives uh, P2 equals, and this works out to minus 0 0.00712 minus 0 0.003588. And this, finally, F of this. Uh, maybe I'll write it up here. Maybe I'll write it up here just to keep things because oops. See, it's, it's a tough thing, right? When the, when it's uh, crummy, there's a lot of stuff. It's very easy to get a little bit mixed up and um, and get rattled. I, I'm not really, I don't know. There's a lot of numbers going on on the page right now. I'm sure that you all understand and forgive me here. Um, but this is the one. This is the one where f of this is, uh, f of this is less. So less than the previously best, so 0 0.0139. And we keep it. And finally, we're at the two iterations. So, yeah. Um, so I have to be mindful, right? I can't make you calculate this for an hour on a test or something like that. Um, but I wanted you to see kind of how this works and how it means, what it means to like go too far and have to test again and have to test again. And, and doing this kind of sequence of steps uh, that lets us hone in on... Um, on what the answer should be. So, uh, uh, right, I think conceptually, it really helps to have that first lecture uh, down in one dimension. Um, but uh, you wanna have that pretty concrete to understand what's going on here, and then use these objects in, uh, in higher dimensions. And then imagine, this is just for two variables. And in practice, uh, these schemes can be used for many, many, many variables, and trying to optimize much more complicated objective functions than what we worked with. Okay, so uh, another question that might come to mind is, well, why don't we just make h, uh, why don't we define h to be much smaller than 0.5? Uh, or multiply it to, by like a quantity that's smaller than a half to shrink the step size down quicker. The problem is that you might not know if a, if a function is uh, complicated enough where the minimum is in particular. 
Here, we just happen to be very, very close to the minimum. And um, dividing that down to get a very small h gets us to a point that's very close to it. Um, here, just a little bit off zero, it looks like. Uh, but in general, you want to be careful about shrinking the step size too much, or you might have trouble actually converging in towards a solution um, uh, in any reasonable time frame. So it's tough. It's tough. There's a, a lot, a lot there to to uh, to deal with, and hopefully some of these calculations make some sense. So um, gradient descent schemes—they're important in optimization, but they come with some challenges. And it's not just it's not just in the formula, right? Suppose we want to solve a problem of finding a global minimum or maximum value. A global min or max is just the highest a function ever achieves on some on its domain, right? Or the lowest. Our scheme, however, finds local extreme points, typically the one nearest to our starting estimate, but those may or may not be global extreme points. So here's an example. Really, really simple. Back to one dimension. I could draw a function that looks like this. Suppose my, suppose my, um, the, the, the function is such that our, our global minimum is right here. So the global min is here. Okay. But imagine that my starting estimate, my P zero, my starting estimate is here. If my starting estimate is here, we'll just think about how the scheme is going to work. It's going to take a look at the direction of steepest descent, uh, steepest descent, which is, well, this way, right? We're going to move to the right. And we're going to take a step size forward here. And it's, it looks like the derivative is negative here. We're going to take a step size, a step forward. And the derivative is positive here. So we're going to take a step backward. And we're going to hone in on this, this minimum point and not the one that we actually want over here. So our scheme, our simple scheme, hones in on this other uh, local min. And oftentimes what uh, mathematicians will say, or people that are working with this stuff, is that you get trapped in a local minimum uh, because essentially there's no way to escape it. So our simple scheme hones in on this other local bin if we have the wrong, if we have the wrong initial guess. So you have to be close enough to the true answer. And again, when you have really complicated functions, it's not as easy as just drawing it and saying, oh, I should start here and then yeah, I get it. Um, you need to do some, uh, a, a lot of really careful stuff, right? You might not even be able to graph the function properly. Um, so there are some, some considerations that have to be made. And I want to talk briefly about them. We're not going to extend this formally, but I'm going to shoot some ideas at you. And then we're going to uh, pack it in for uh, this lecture. So we're not going to explicitly explore this in the course, because I, I just want to give you an idea for how this scheme works so that you can apply it when and if you see it later in other courses or later in life. As I said, it's a really popular scheme and a lot of people are using it for stuff like um, neural networks, artificial intelligence uh, applications and such uh, to solve very difficult problems. Okay, this local extreme point problem is one that many researchers have tried to get around by using a variety of, of approaches. So one thing is maybe you don't know where the extreme points are. So maybe instead of just doing this once, you sample a whole bunch of points and you, you play a bunch of gradient descent games all at once. So sample a bunch of different starting values and do a lot of gradient descents and see what values each one of them converges to. The value that is lowest, where f of the function is the least, that has a better chance of being the global minimum. There's still no guarantee, right? Because there might be one that's like in between two of your estimates that you don't catch. But by having multiple starting estimates, maybe you have a better chance of catching it. Um, another thing, another thing that uh, I, I've heard of before is suppose you're doing this scheme and your H values are decreasing, and you're coming in, and you're like, oh, you know what? I think we've got this, this minimum point. 
you can pretty well estimate once you got that H within that one one millionth, one one billionth or whatever, you can say, you know what? I'm pretty sure this here is going to be a minimum, but maybe we could do better. Who knows? We've established that this here is a minimum. Why not give her estimate? Um, as a Southern Belle might say when she adds Tabasco sauce to her gravy, let's give that estimate a kiak. Uh, and we search in different directions, perhaps with a large step size. So that means that record the minimum point that you're at, and then maybe randomly shoot out in a different direction with a huge step size to try and bounce out to a further, far away location and continue to play the game. Because if you do that, maybe you find yourself on the other side of a hump and you start to come in towards a new local minimum. And maybe that local minimum is more minimum than the one you were at before and therefore has a chance of being a global minimum. Uh, and then of course you could repeat the process a billion times and have a better chance of finding what you need to find. So, but it's tough and it depends on the function and some of these functions are incredibly difficult. There are lots of improvements to the basic gradient descent scheme. And what we've done here is do a 1D example and uh, a more general uh, 2D example, but uh, it extends easily to higher dimensions and there are lots of ways you can twist it to try and make it better. Uh, so your textbook might go into a few of these and there are tons of resources out there online these days that will talk a little bit more about those things too. So if you're interested, um, you should spend some time with it because as I said, this is a really useful technique that a lot of people are using these days and uh, it might be good to understand how they work. So um, that's where we're gonna leave that for today. Lots of talking, a long, a long lecture, but I wanted to spend due time to, to walk you through one problem with a bit of a graphical representation so you can see it with your eyes, what's happening, and hopefully all of the different pieces um, make some sense. So um, I have one more lecture in me for this topic, and it's gonna be on coding. So stay tuned for that. It should be fairly short. This one's a, a bit on the longer side, um, but I appreciate your attention and uh, I hope to see you soon. Take care of yourselves.